So thanks everyone for joining me today, today in the talk about uh, liability of machine learning systems. I know that it can be pretty hard some, sometimes um, to take the time in the evening after a long day. So I think it's always good to take a deep breath first. So we can all take together a deep breath. <sighs> I'm doing this because I'm also a lot into meditation and yoga. And it's always good to breathe, because we tend to not breathe enough. Now to the talk. Um, I'm going to talk about changes of liability in regards of machine learning systems. And I want to start by showing you the table of contents, or the outline, what, to, what I, I want to talk about and how I want to structure it. First I want to talk about myself, what qualifies me to speak about this topic. Uh, second, I want to introduce the problem and the issue at hand. The second, uh, the third thing actually is uh, machine learning and the key component, the autonomous decision. The fourth point is basics of liability in civil law, because I assume that uh, not, not all of you have studied law. And I will introduce some possible solutions and finish up with a conclusion. So first of all, how many of you are programmers or work in the IT industry? Show your hands. All right. Um, so how many of you are working in the legal field or have a legal education? All right, awesome. <coughs> all right. Um, so first about me. Okay, that's too fast. <laughs> so, my name is Daniel Deutsch. Uh, I studied uh, business law at the VUV, uh, the University of Business <coughs> and Economics. I did the master's degree. And I covered this topic that I'm talking about today in my master thesis. Um, my supervisor was Professor Kodek. He is a judge at the Supreme Court, uh, the OGH, Oberste Gerichtshof. And um, with talking about uh, this topic, I want to bring some academic um, knowledge and findings into the, into the meetup scene. I also study the artificial intelligence studies at the JKU, the Johannes Kepler University in Linz. And I have various certifications in computer science and worked as a web developer, uh, technical project manager and a traditional law clerk at the district court. I'm also a consultant at Galacta with focus on AI. So you can look it up if you're interest, interested. But what we are doing is basically consulting in, in regards of digital transformation, digital lean, um, basically supply chain management and how you can improve it by new technologies. Let's start with the problem. You, some of you might have heard about it. Um, there is a very famous dilemma situation that is called the trolley problem. And in this problem, you have a train that is going on the railway and heading towards two five workers on the railway. You have a person here that is able to uh, take a switch and direct the train to a different track and just killing one person. So this is a very uh, famous and philosophical uh, debate, debate and, and prob problem situation and there are basically no real results for it because you shall not um, compare human lives. So it is not justifiable to sacrifice one human instead of five humans, just because there are more people to be safe. To be safe. So this is a very uh, traditional problem. Some of you might know it. And the question arises now: What has this to do with machine learning systems or AI? And in this case, there was a famous study that is conducted by the MIT, um, and it is called the Moral Machine. In, in this study, and you can see the link there if you still want to uh, go to it and test it out, 
But basically what you have is that you have situations like these here. Um, you should decide, as a user, whether you should kill pedestrians here, or maybe you should decide to not kill the pedestrians, but then you probably would kill the passengers. So there are various, <clears throat> various situations and different, different cases and different questions on how you would solve problems like these. And there were interesting results. First of all, there is no clear winner. There is no clear result. It is always difficult. And especially across countries, there are different tendencies on how to decide on who to save and who to kill. What we can see here from this figure is that in general there are tendencies. So first of all, there is a clear tendency to spare humans instead of pets. There is also a tendency to spare more characters than just one. Sparing the young, uh, sparing the lawful behaving people, higher st st status, sparing the fit, sparing females rather than males, or sparing pedestrians rather than sparing passengers. So those are interesting tendencies, but yet there is no clear winner or no cle not a clear answer. So I think this summarizes pretty well the, the problem situation we can face with machine learning systems or AI systems, because we have to take moral dilemmas uh, into a, a, a solution that has to work now. And never before in history there was a situation like this. We had to solve this problem uh, right now. So the next step or the next question is, what is the real problem of a dilemma like this or in, in current uh, way of developing software? And from a legal point of view, view um, the issue with autonomous decision is that it is sometimes unpredictable and also sometimes not comprehensible. Some of you, or most of you, might have heard the term black box behavior. And what you can see here is a deep neural network. And as you might know that in some of those arch architectures, it is not 100% comprehensible why a decision was made in a certain way. You just know the input and you know the output. You know what you feed the machine to learn from, and you know that a certain decision was made. But you don't know exactly why the decision was made. And this is also, there is also a famous movement now called uh, Explainable AI, where they try to make those algorithms explainable, because it is important, um, especially for law and legal situations. Um, but this is the key problem. Having a, an autonomous decision that is unpredictable, and not comprehensible. And there are other questions that arise uh, as well. For example, what does autonomous mean? Autonomous means, in this case, independent from human interaction, which is very critical when having a legal point of view, because in history, everything uh, evolved around the human element, especially regarding liability, as we will see uh, in the next slides. There is also another critical component that is behavior analysis and evidence of causality. Because if a damage has been done, you first of all have to understand the behavior of the machine to, contribute, uh, to attribute the behavior to it. And the second one is the evidence of causality. Uh, you need to make visible that the machine did something and the damage occurs because of it. So this is meant by causality. And this is difficult with uh, some deep neural machine learning uh, archi uh, architectures or systems. Uh, excuse me. You yes. Did, you, you had the option of inaction before as well. So inaction. In, yeah, in, in, in this list uh, with preferences. Yeah. Yes. The, 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 the top most was inaction versus versus action. Uh, so preference for, for action, preference for inaction. Yes. So, so why is it? necessary that the machine does something, it could just do nothing and it's the, pro it's the same problem. Um, it, is, it is not necessary that the machine does something. Um, from a legal point of view, 
you just need to have some evidence that something had happened and you can attribute it to the machine. So it doesn't matter if the machine decided something or not. If you want to have evidence that the machine caused something, you have to provide that evidence at some point. Can I add something here? Uh, yes. Is it not doing anything as well as decision? That's the point. That's the point, right? So, so it's not a question if the machine has made a decision. If you plot the situation uh, and, and you say, like, uh, who, who is to blame or who is, who is responsible? But, yes. But, but not, uh, is, the, is, the, is the decision predictable or not? That's not the question here. Of, of, of course, because if you do not take an action that caused the damage, then there is no liability at all. Yeah, of course. So you would have to um, give a certain example where an inaction would have no damage or would have or would cause damage. Right. So if we have a certain situation like this, we can evaluate and see if there is uh, attribution for it. Mm -hmm. But um, I, may, I think maybe we can, after, after the talk, we can elaborate on a more specific example. And I also will give uh, an example later on. So I think this was everything I wanted to talk about here. Yes, so let's um, just go over the basic liability con uh, concepts in civil law, in the Austrian civil law. It is important to understand that I'm talking about liability in the sense of compensation for damages, which means um, that somebody caused a, a damage to a person and the person wants compensation, which is not a contract partner. Like for example, in the, in the, in the streets, when a car hits you, that is a classic exa example for, for those types of liability. Another important thing is that in liability cases, there is the uh, famous uh, phrase, casum sentit dominus, uh, which basically means that if damage occurs to your things, to yourself, um, you have to bear the damage yourself. Basic, basic principle. So if you just have bad luck and you have damage because of bad luck, then you have to deal with it, so to say. There are, of course, exceptions to this rule. That's why we are here. Um, and the exception is if there is an interruption of grounds for attribution. And there are different types in the Austrian uh, law of grounds for attribution. One is, or a famous one is, the fault-based liability. That is freely translated. In German it would mean Verschuldenshaftung. And it basically means that if somebody caused you damage because of a faulty behavior, because he did it on purpose or because he did not uh, take enough care of his actions, then there is a, that, that's a ground of attribution. Another uh, liability is the strict liability, and is in German Gefährdungshaftung, and a very famous example is in the code for motor vehicles and railway plans. Basically, when you're driving a car, you are in the uh, strict liability regime so if you cause someone else damage as a car driver, then you don't need this fault-based uh, base that you have in the other uh, liability system. You, just because you navigate a car which is considered dangerous, you have to uh, bear liability. And of course it's a little bit different because you have an insurance system, but this is just the basic liability system. And then we have a third category, which is uh, special cases of the uh, ABGB, the General Civil Code. And there are some examples, and those examples uh, are often mentioned in discussions regarding liability. And one example would be the liability for the owner of pets. So often, machine learning systems are compared to wild animals. So there is the question, can you uh, make use of those special regulations in the general civil code, which is designed for animals, uh, for machine learning systems? 
Um, yes, so those are the basic principles of liability in the Austrian law. Now, what are the problems? First of all, when we look at the fault-based, the Verschuldenshaftung, uh, the fault-based liability, we have the issue with a human element, because in, uh, in, in, the, in the legal text, but also uh, in, the, in the court decision, it's always necessary to have a human, because faulty behavior is a human, a human um, related element. The second thing with Gefährdungshaftung, uh, the strict liability, is that first of all you need a requirement of a dangerous activity, which can be uh, really high according to the decisions of the court. Because for example a car is dangerous, a railway plant is dangerous, but sometimes, like for example a lawnmower, is not considered dangerous. Another issue with the Gefährdungshaftung is statutory basis, because those uh, liability uh, rules are uh, manifested in, in, a, in an own law, like for example the, the one uh, with the motor vehicles, and you cannot find a general rule in the general uh, code. And the third, the third point, special cases, um, the problem with those are that they are simply not applicable because you do not have an animal, you have a machine learning system. And an animal and a machine learning system are two very different things. <clears throat> so what are possible solutions, or are there solutions in the Austrian law system? <clears throat> and I want to illustrate it with, an, with a case study. I've created a case study that does not uh, involve autonomous self-driving cars, but rather an autonomous lawnmower. Because there are certain lawnmowers on the market, and uh, by the definition they decide on their own where to cut grass and what to cut. <clears throat> so in this case study, uh, we have an owner of the lawnmower, of the autonomous lawnmower, and it is cutting the grass in his garden. Unfortunately, there is a gap in the fence, so the lawnmower goes to the neighbor's garden and cuts the flowers, the expensive flowers of the neighbor. So now the question arises, who is liable? Is it the owner, the user of the lawnmower, or is it the manufacturer, or the programmer, or the programming uh, company? <clears throat> so the legislata, the current law, has various solutions for this problem. First of all, there is a solution in the fault-based liability. It's understandable that the machine, the robot, is not able to bear liability because it's a machine, because it's a program. But uh, judication has evolved with something that is called Ingerenzpflicht, and it is related <laughs> Uh, to Sorgfaltsmaßstab, which basically means um, depending on the level of care you put into using a machine, you can be liable because you have to attri att attribute, attribute the behavior of the machine that is your machine to the human. And in the case with the lawnmower, uh, it would be acceptable for the human to have a look in the garden and see, ah, there is a gap in the fence, so I should have checked my garden and make sure that the robot does not cause damage on the neighbor's garden. The issue with this is that it is, of course, very dependent on each single case. So the court or adjudication has to evolve with each single case. Another solution would be a, strict, a form of strict liability, uh, which is liability for, liability for defective goods or defective products. And for this, there needs to be a defective product on the market, like for example the lawnmower. You also have to define product, which is by the way not easy, but in this case it is easy because it is an embedded system. You just have a computer inside the lawnmower and it is connected to the lawnmower. Then, and that's a little bit tricky, is the faulty 
or the defective part of the product. And what, what does defective mean? It means a disappointed expect, expectation of security. So it depends heavily how the manufacturer or the producer is marketing his product and what type of security the user uh, can expect. So in the case of the lawnmower, the autonomous lawnmower, the manufacturer would have to make clear that if there are no um, checks in the garden done by the human, that the robot would also be able to go to the neighbor's garden and cause damage. So of course this is not easy to say, it's also again very dependent on each single case, but in the end the manufacturer has a high risk of liability for a small ability to control the activity of his products. So it's also not a perfectly good so solution, but just for the understanding, there are solutions in the current liability system. So what else would be interesting to have? And this is the legal Ferenda, which means it's possible future law. There are ideas of having the robot for claiming damages, which means you can just get the money from the robot. And the literature is heavily against this concept, so this is not an option. <laughs> um, we have an expanded, expanded liability for products combined with an insurance system. This will most certainly be the case in the future. And there, there is another option to create a new strict liability that is designed for machine learning systems. And my argument for this is that unpredictability creates liability. It doesn't really matter uh, what type of product you have, doesn't matter if it's autonomous, lawnmower, car, trading algorithm, whatever. Just because you cannot predict and also not comprehend it, it is dangerous. And my idea would be to have an orientation uh, like the EKG, the law on civil liability against motor vehicles and railway plants, the same uh, law you have for driving a car, for example. So you have an accident, you have a certain activity involved with humans, you have liable persons, and you have some relief from liability. So this was basically the overview of the problems and some possible solutions, but what shall we do right now in this situation? As there are many initiatives of the European Union, like for example legislative initiative uh, procedures for AI related topics, we also have the evaluation of various directives, like for example the li liability of defective products, and we also have ethic guidelines for trustworthy AI. So there are many uh, initiatives of the European Union to uh, find solutions for those problems. And on an Austrian, or from an Austrian point of view, it is advisable to wait for the decisions on the level of the European Union. Simply because uh, if the European Union find solutions and will find solutions regarding AI and machine learning systems, then it has to work for all the member states and not just Austria, of course. And yes, we have a system with European law and Austrian law that has to work together. Ultimately, it comes down to a race between innovation and regulation, as often with uh, technology and law. Um, you don't want to over-regulate and hinder innovation but then, of course, you also uh, want some regulation and not have a lot of damages in the civilization. So, what are possible requirements for programming companies, for example? Well, many of you are in the IT industry. So, what would the future look like for you? Or how may your tasks or your actions change? And those are some requirements that will change in the future. For creating machine learning systems or AI systems, you have to find some way to implement law, law rules. You have to implement some industry specific experience. Like, for example, if you develop an autonomous driving car, you cannot only implement the law, 
but you also have to have some industry specific experience or even general experience of life. Um, what do I mean by that? If you have an object on the street, for example, the car should be able to understand I cannot hit this object on the road, I have to cross the, the line, which I shall not cross normally, but now for this special occasion I have to cross it. Um, and this is just some experience my AI system has to understand and has to learn as well. And of course there is some general experience of life, which is nearly impossible to adopt, but um, that's the thing with, with humans. Uh, we like to have the benefits and advantages of machine uh, learning systems or AI, um, but then we also want it to be human-like in a good sense. And of course, ultimately, you need to implement some quality assurance and control options. So if the machine is, is going crazy and doing something you do not like, you want to stop it. So those are the legal requirements in the future. Um, I think I gave a broad overview of the topics and the challenges that lie ahead uh, for programmers, but also for normal human beings. Uh, I want to thank you for your attention. And if you have any questions, you can ask them now. Um, you can also always contact me. Um, and I also have prepared some general questions if you don't have any specific questions. Mm -hmm. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot again for this really fascinating topic and very important topic, which we will face, of course. Um, are there any questions now? Because there was already a discussion. <coughs> okay. Hi, thanks Hi. for the talk. Um, do you have any idea about um, machine learning applications in health and how this is discussed on EU level or especially not EU anymore but UK? Because I think the UK um, health system heavily relies already on machine learning, which is not a bad thing because they are better than and doctors right now. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I think this um, takes into account many, many more questions. First of all, you have the problem with uh, not being in the EU anymore. So this is a question that has to be solved, and I most certainly don't have an answer for that. Um, but I think it comes ultimately down to, uh, again, the solution of the European Union. And I think other countries, maybe they stipulate a contract with the EU or don't, I don't know, but they will heavily um, orientate on the solution of the EU, I think. And regarding medical medical solutions, um, I haven't really witnessed any special cases regarding liability, but I think um, the general rules apply in this sense as well. Um, there is a lot of uh, adjudication about um, doctors acting a, a certain way, and shall act and have to act a certain way, um, they cannot have a relief of liability just by putting um, the decision into a machine. So it will be, as I said before, let's summarize it, uh, or let's assume it is in default-based liability, it will be under the Ingerenzpflicht where the doctor or the team, the medical team, has to check if the decision of the, of the machine is uh, a bad decision, so to say. Um, yeah, so I would summarize it under the fault-based um, liability in this case. Yeah, for medical treatment. You have a question? Yeah. Uh, thank you. There was, uh, you introduced a case study uh, um, regarding the lawnmower, but uh, do you also have an example from the real world or how some um, <laughs> uh, I'm just bringing yeah, something no, that, that, no, no, that it's a good decisions, and the decisions, optional decisions will be shown. Yeah, yeah, and the answer is obviously no. <laughs> That's why I came up with the, uh, no, well, it's not obviously, but it's, uh, with the case study, I want to provide an easy to understand example. And of course, there is no adjudication on machine learning system, or at least I uh, didn't found an example during my research. So, no, <laughs> not yet. But there will be some, and uh, as my supervisor is already a judge, um, he would also come to similar solutions. So, 
yeah, we have to wait. We have to wait and yeah, see how how machine learning uh, products are performing on the market. Okay. Thank uh, thanks very much. Um, in the two examples that you gave, um, the, the consequences of uh, those automated decisions are obviously different. So, I mean, in the in the lawnmower case, yeah, I mean, it's sad for the person that they lost their their flowers, but you know, they could probably still get up the next morning and life will go on. Yes. Um, but of course, in the tram case, the situation is rather different. I mean, that's that's a question of life and death. Yes. Um, so, the um, do you think that there should be a different or different legal ways to handle the sort of different consequences um, of the decisions of different algorithms and the severity um, and potential kind of yeah, damage done um, by those decisions? Um, of course, basically yes, but I think the, the system, the liability system is uh, in a such a way designed that you can find differences uh, in the adjudication. So generally, you have the same um, uh, steps of, of examining a, a case, and this is, is, is there a damage, is there a fault, is it against the law, and is there a causality? So if you have those four requirements, you are always in the liability, in terms of uh, fault-based uh, liability, and how much the compensation is, is always dependent on the, on the court decision. So I think there will be some standards in the future, um, but for designing a special or specific law in handling uh, the size of compensation, I think no, there will be not such a thing because it is you cannot um, design or, or you cannot find solutions for every possible case, and that's why it is designed this way. You just have um, the requirements for attributing liability or damage, and then you have the court decision that uh, decides on how high the damage shall be, at least in the civil law uh, context, if that answers your question. Yes? Awesome. <laughs> Thank you. Um, the question about uh, liability of uh, not using an AI system. So for example, if the doctor has an accuracy of 90% uh, detecting cancer, mm -hmm. AI algorithm has an accuracy of 95%, it would be dangerous to not use an AI assisted system. Um, yes, I'm not quite sure if we are already in that stage, um, but still, uh, the, still uh, the same principle supply. So ultimately, in, in our current situation, as far as I know, uh, the doctor is making the decision. So if he uses uh, AI system or not, that's up to him. Um, it is up to adjudication to decide if it is standard practice for a doctor in the future to consult an AI trained system to help his decision making. But currently, I don't think that there is so, such a practice. There will be most certainly in the future um, but still, just, um, just the fact that the AI system does not get 100% correct is a little bit a problem because um, you cannot, make, you cannot uh, have the AI system make the decision. Uh, humans would not be comfortable with just having the AI decision, even if it's better. But I think there are some studies that have shown that people tend to like human decision, even if it's uh, worse. Thank you. <clears throat> so I think uh, one of the conclusions you were noting was that programmers need to respect or implement the rules or law as written. Mm -hmm. um, now if you, if you think about the Traffic Act, the Straßenverkehrsordnung yes. in Austria, right? Mm -hmm. um, you might find some uh, paragraphs which are stated not in a way that you could implement them in the computer because there is too much room for it. Uh, Interpretation, right? Yes. And there's no concrete numbers, etc. Yes. So how would you expect them to do that? Or do you think? Actually, the question is: Do you think that there's going to be a, a change in the in the legal system for exactly these cases to have this more tangible or broken yeah. down for computers? Um, in the future, yeah, sure. Um, but for now, um, as you said, it's nearly impossible to find solutions for that. And so far, there is not such a standard. 
uh, the European Union, but also Austrian government is working on uh, having higher standards for programmers and programming companies. Um, but as you pointed out correctly, um, it is nearly impossible to implement all of these uh, rules like law rules or uh, industry specific regulation. This is simply not possible yet and uh, practice has to evolve and I, I think also law will uh, evolve but I think there is a lot of time, time between those uh, steps. But do you think that there is going to be an own law, especially for example for autonomous cars, exactly um, stating how they should behave, which can be implemented? Um, uh, as I suggested in my solution, um, I would suggest to have an own strict liability for machine learning systems, not not specified for cars. It can be uh, for autonomous or whatever for the car sector or industry specific regulation. Um, but in general, I don't think this will uh, work just because there are so many cases. In terms of the car situation, maybe, maybe, but then we have to wait uh, to see the evolution of autonomous driving cars. So if there is uh, in the next future a high chance that we have self-driving cars, maybe, but I cannot uh, uh, go further and say anything because you don't know, never know. Any additional questions? Um, so, basically under, under US or UK common law countries, you can theoretically write a liability statement that says we're not liable for anything in theory. Like you, you, can, you can exclude yourself from liability. Um, whereas in Germanic and EU, country law generally that's not as possible. It's not taking very broad strokes here. But do you think this differences will meet, will stifle innovation in the EU because a US company could theoretically say, once you agree to use our lawnmower, I'll take the lawnmower example, we're not liable for anything as long as you follow the exact rules and regulations as we say it. Whereas in the EU, that's not exactly possible. <laughs> and so do you think they'll change the, the levels of innovations in these traditional areas because of that? Um, I think there is a heavy discussion in the literature about this, um, but I think it's very difficult to uh, provide an answer to that, simply because both systems are very different, just in the way how they are designed, how they evolve. Um, so I guess what the European also does always when they of course try to make law, they try to not hinder innovation in a certain way. So um, I think there is an effort in the European Union to have regulation that is not hindering innovation. Um, and I think that's basically, there is an effort to not hinder innovation. But in terms of UK or um, American uh, ways, I don't know. <laughs> Uh, I don't know. I think you cannot say this in the... Yeah, I think, yeah, you cannot. I can only uh, uh, link to the literature that is discussing it, but there is also, as far as I've witnessed, no clear solution. But it also doesn't really matter for us in this situation, I would say, because both systems have to evolve and find solution for those types of cases. And you can only say ex post uh, after everything was done, what would have been better or what was better, I think. Oh, thank you. Uh, so this might be maybe a too much of a sci-fi, but in the future, when we have the, the actual AI models, um, that theoretically we could, uh, we could hold the car liable or something like that, like in the Knight Rider series in the past yes. and so on. Yeah. You could theoretically uh, help the car liable. So I was wondering whether there are any like uh, series, as in, in law literature discussions going on, when is the model or the AI system advanced enough to be able to comprehend that it's yes. being punished, etc. Yes, yes, it's a good question and um, I think, as I showed, um, there is with the first one, the robot for claiming damages, that is exactly that. And there is heavily discussion about consciousness, but then you have the problem, what is consciousness? And when you want to define consciousness, you already have a problem. So you would need to find a definition for consciousness, 
and then you have to transfer it into some legal text. <laughs> then you also have to find a legal solution for this context. So uh, I think this is very, very, very far away. And that's why the literature is nearly 100% against this solution. Um, but in the future, maybe. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> And the additional question is, uh, if you decide the machine is liable, which kind of punishment would be there? <laughs> the, the machine uh, can... Ah, you're connected to this question, right? Um, I think there has to be... I think there is... Um, pun with punishment, you mean compensation, right? Compensation in terms of money or... Well, if a, if a human does a, a fault, <laughs> then you may go to prison or, or yes <laughs> but, uh, okay yeah yeah this is a different situation when you have um, not civil law but criminal law um, and I think when we have the situation that we have conscious AI robots we will have to come up with a criminal code for those machines yes <laughs> but it's very very far away I think it wouldn't be a problem when you have a singularity, which is anyway them dominating the financial market, it will be liable and it will pay you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> be, immediately when the damage is caused, you will have the uh, exact sum on your bank account. I think that's not the problem. <laughs> Probably, yes. So if we're talking about the singularity, yes, we don't have to have any problems with those scenarios anymore. <laughs> Additional, additional questions? <laughs> One more. Um, changing this a little bit about you might be the expert. How far are we along um, applying machine learning and artificial intelligence in law? Actually in law, because I think these are highly structured texts, actually. They are standardized and I think law students as you mm -hmm. might might um, be an expert on they really sit there and study and just try to remember mm -hmm. stuff and remembering stuff is for machine not hard connecting the dots maybe but still mm -hmm. this is also in this very highly standardized nomenclature which is used in law <coughs> as a as a non law person yeah. this looks like a really basic NLP problem which <laughs> has not been detected even with the easy law basically. Yes. Do you know anything about that? Um, can you give us an update? I can only talk from personal experience because I, as a, a lawyer, lawyer now and also a um, programmer, I really want to have a solution for exactly the thing you're uh, talking about and I also discussed it with a uh, few people before the uh, event today. Um, in my experience, um, the big law firms are all working on something like this and they all, or most of them, already have. Um, machine learning based solutions in terms of structuring uh, documents, finding, um, classifying certain certain statements and also finding some vague projection on, on how a, a case might uh, end. But in general I think the majority of law firms, especially in, in Austria, I can only talk from Austria because I've talk, uh, have been talking to those law firms or some of those, um, they are. They want to implement something, but most of them aren't. Most of the time, because it's a question of money. Okay. Yes, because yeah, because those there's systems are sold at that price. Yeah, there's there's one Austrian company which I cannot remember the name of a startup that actually has an interesting system, kind of like the doctors doing. It doesn't actually make a decision, but it will take a, a legal case and match it up with the appropriate law. And essentially highlight the key points. Oh, okay. So and I can't remember that. I met about a couple of years ago. So they're doing that. So it sort of gives the it sort of gets rid of the young lawyer's job. Yeah. It leaves the, the final. Result. Okay. I think the general problem with this type of industry is that for implementing uh, something that helps you deciding legal cases, you really have a high confidence rate. You really have to have a really high prediction. A high confidence that the solution is working because otherwise people would not like to have it mm. because there are some some um, surveys on if people like AI judges for example or if people like to have a robot lawyer 
Uh, and most of the times, people do not really uh, want to have, in, in those type of scenarios, AI um, systems, simply because it is too important, too, much, too high value to them, and they don't trust machines. So this is, I think, in general, a huge uh, aspect, also in the medical field. Uh, people tend to have the maybe even wrong uh, decision and information, but are happier because it comes from a human. Yet, but I think it will change in the future. Uh, a curiosity question. Um, what was the motivation behind your decision to move from law to artificial intelligence? And do you remember exactly the point when you made this decision? And yeah, yes. <laughs> are you still happy to combine law and artificial intelligence? Um, the two different competences. Yes. Uh, so the point when I wanted to transition was when I was taking a, uh, working as a tax associate and I was doing all the repetitive, repetitive uh, work and I thought we could automate it but um, they don't want to automate it, I don't know why, they are scared or whatever so I decided for myself to learn the program um, and regarding the tr transition uh, because I think it's the future, um, I think the, the law or the legal system is one of the very few industries that is not using the capabilities of technology. And I don't understand why, and I hate it, and that's why I also give those talks <laughs> to uh, also to other people, because we have absurd situations where Austrian law contradicts to European law. And now the Austrian law has to be uh, extinguished, so to say. And this is absurd, because if you program a framework like this, it could never happen that one rule is contradicting a higher rule. So this is absurd, and also with the documents and the structure, it could be so much faster. Um, yes, but yeah, in general I think uh, it is the future, and I think if you have the capabilities of learning something really difficult and that is changing the future, I think it would be AI, and uh, ultimately I do not uh, regret it, no. Um, but of course it's, it's good to have also a legal education. But it depends on each person, of course. I just like mathematics. It's it's uh, more concise than natural language, of course, which is one of the main issues with law, because they have to use natural language. But nobody understands mathematics language, or well, not many people. <clears throat>